playing guitar naked. He was auditioning for the band, playing the guitar naked with this wild dreadlock hairdo. And Trent goes, call him. Mark O'Shea was the tour manager, road manager for Nine Inch Nails on their first tour. He's and totally second. And second tour. <laughs> yes, pretty, like- hate, pretty Hate Machine and then the wonderful and lovely Downward Spiral. Spoken like a tour manager, right, Trent? He's like, hey, <laughs> get your shit together, Rody. <laughs> Okay, first and second Nine Inch Nails tours. He's toured with the Jesus and Mary Chain, Peter Murphy, Catherine Wheel, Butthole Surfers, Gravity Kills, Godhead, Sister Soleil, Gus Gus, and Pig Face. He's currently running the Wonder Bus Music Festival and is in the and is the production manager at the Goodyear Theater. My second guest is Trent Weller. He's worked as a tour manager amongst other various positions. Four, Avenge Sevenfold, Lamb of God, High on Fire, Kitty, Mushroom Head, Dope, Shadows Fall, and Spud Monsters. He was a journalist, magazine editor, and the owner of U.S. Rocker Magazine in Cleveland, Ohio. In addition, he helped open and then actually worked at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for three years. Hello, guys. Hello. <laughs> you see that i did like the whole thing i sucked it in like a real actor would i was like these two guys are very very very." i thought it sounded all right anyway i'm gonna open a beer because i'm happy you could you could could sell an old lady a bra with that voice (laughs) (laughs) the jokes continue (laughs) so i'd love to start off with nine inch nails Don't don't ever don't ever interview one of my mentors why who's that weasel strict nine that guy make you die Uh, laughing yeah, you know what? You, you got to get him on because you're right, Marco. He'd be great. He's hilarious. He knows everybody. He should be the. He should be president. Who is it? <laughs> president Weasel. President Weasel, Weasel? Strict Nine. All right, I'm on it. I'll look Celebrity him up. out of Cleveland. Um, truck driver, bus driver, stage manager. Um, all I thought you the- told me that Trent was the best thing out of Cleveland. <laughs> That's what you said. Well, once he left. Oh, okay. Okay. The place has never been the same. <laughs> Oddly oh. enough, probably not. So with Nine Inch Nails, uh, everybody yeah. loves their Nine Inch Nails. It's pretty amazing to me reading this that you fucking did a van tour with Nine Inch Nails. It's pretty amazing. I, mean, <laughs> I, I did several. Um, actually, one of our first tour vehicles was my brother Michael's Chevy Suburban, which had no heat. And um, we used it because it had the, you know, the front bench seat and the back bench seat, and then it had the big cargo bay. Did you guys cuddle <laughs> to keep warm? No, but the, keep the, warm, not for any other reason. No, but the famous, <laughs> the famous uh, appearance that they did on um, Dance Party USA. Yeah. We, we drove that to Philly, uh, we loaded out of the practice space, drove straight to Philly, drove through a raging snowstorm, freezing weather, and I'm literally down to a t-shirt in the front seat, and I don't remember who's sitting in the front, because the guys in the bench seat were like, oh my God, Mark, we gotta turn the heat on. So the only heat was in the front of the car. It was just (laughs) insane, you know, starting that way, and then going to vans, and then going to, um, we were renting vans and then I said, this is stupid. So I bought a van, a 50, no, great, the best touring van ever made the Ford E350 club wagons, you know, they had the four bench seats to take out the back bench seat. And I had the heavy, tra- heavy suspension put in it and a big giant hitch with that diamond plate bumper. And it had two gas tanks. You could go almost 700 miles on that thing without stopping for gas. Oh, that's pretty amazing. Cruise control, two captain's chairs, and it was carpeted. So how many shows did you guys have to do to pay for all the gas? 700 Um, gallons worth of gas. Oh, man, come on. Not gallons. It would be 700 miles worth of gas, huh? Huh? Right, 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 right. But it had to switch underneath the dash. And you just literally, when you emptied one tank, you'd hit it and you'd go, boop. 
putting it <laughs> right up. Those things were the best. And if you had the right one, it had the, the dual air conditioner system to where you'd, you'd go ace on the front, the front dash, you'd hit it. And the guys in the back could just reach up in the ceiling and control their air. You'd never heard a peep from the band. It's kind of like, it's kind of like a band doing an encore. You're kind of like, yeah. wait, there's more. Click. It, it was great. It was, it was. And forget our it, big hit. Hold on, guys. <laughs> I mean, after the Bowie tour, when we were hanging out in New Orleans, Trent said, I missed the van days. And I said, you silly knucklehead, you could go out and tour in a van any day. Yeah, he, he could. Said, he goes, do you still have your van? I go, no. You told me we were going to be on the road for a year and a half. I sold it. <laughs> We'll get you a van. We'll do it. What are they? GoFundMe. We'll do uh, get a GoFundMe for you guys, and we'll buy you a crappy van. It'll be like the old days. Be so nice. I've, I've seen a van that looked just like my old van. It had like that blue color theme to it. Did you guys see that thing where they um, they found the Aerosmith tour van from '69? Oh hey, yeah. wait a minute. Yeah. He was originally from Sunapee, New Hampshire. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. And. I went up to Sunapee, New Hampshire to work on a um, construction project when I was no longer touring. Okay. And the client we were working for was Donna and Harry Gazelle. They owned property uh, starting back to maybe the late seventies and on their property is a barn. And in the barn, I think it was either his, uh, some kind of old yellow sports car. It was either an Opal. A few we're talking Opal. about who? We're talking about Steven Tyler? Who are Steven we talking Tyler. about? Steven Tyler. Okay. Up there, he's known as Steven Tellerico. And, um, he had to change his name because he's so fucking infamous. Right. Either that so, or the music guys couldn't spell. So he's like, we'll just call myself Tyler. Yeah. I saw his <laughs> father play piano at a piano bar. When I oh, that's awesome. So how's dad? his dad's a great musician? or? Yes, he is. So making a long story short, she had this yellow sports car in her barn for like 25 years. Okay. And she was trying to get it back to him for years and years and years. And then one day, as she tells it, she ran into him and she said, Stephen, there, you still have a car in my barn. And he's like, what? He's like, is that yeah, a sexual he's... innuendo? No. Yeah. <laughs> it's not my it kid. Up. Okay. I got enough kids. I got enough kids. <laughs> he brought it. I guess he brought it up there. And he just boop, forgot about it. And they gave it back to him and he took it back. So whatever happened to it after then, who knows? Wow. It's like a whole thing now. I got a, a buddy of mine. His sister just has some old beat up truck and someone reached out out of the blue and like nothing crazy, but wanted to pay her fair market value. And it was because it was their wedding anniversary of this guy. And he mm -hmm. wanted to give his wife his, her first truck back. And uh, she got it when she was 16 years old and he wanted to find her truck. And it was in California and uh, she's like, you know what? Sure. So she sold it to him for what it was worth, really. Wow. And uh, it's kind of a fun little thing, right? I'm like, it's a scam. It's a scam. It's a scam. But it was not a scam. And uh, I guess everybody's happy. So I wonder if Steven Tyler's driving an Opal around. Probably not. Many cars. It's now in his barn. I'd be surprised if he was even driving. <laughs> True. Yeah. yeah. So what did it? So his old man was just random. You went into the bar, or uh, you knew he was. No, his or... father would do like a. Um, thanks, man. His father would do um, would play in um, a bar up there every now and then. And I forget his father's name, but his father was a pianist, and he was, you know, he's funny. He's much, you know. I, I think I saw him. Good lord, I think at that time it was like he had to have been like eighty-five or ninety or something. Did he play any Aerosmith stuff? No, he did not. He's a classy fucking guy. The that Green Bond intro or anything? Or? No, he, he played the uh, Cold November Rain by Guns N' Roses. Oh. Good call right there. I like Dad. <laughs> I want to see Dad open up for Aerosmith. Right? Like, <laughs> I like it. Let's, let, let's, let's, let's talk to Trent here. Trent, you got anything good to say? Oh, I got a lot of stories. I got a lot of stuff. I got to be careful what I say. What, what, it, yeah, I know. Your, Watch this, Mark guy. <laughs> how's your five-year mark? Your uh, your five-year uh, uh, ex expiration plan. I'm not sure if I remember what that is. You were going to quit working, is by the sound. No, of no, it, no, right? no. The, what is the, what do they call that uh, when you sign a uh, an oh, NDA? NDA. Your NDA clauses have all expired. 
You know, yeah, I got to, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do. I had a, a couple things fall in my lap right before COVID that were pretty cool. And, um, you know, we'll see what happens. I, I think I'm ready to go back out here soon. You know, it's been a couple of years. I took some time off um, after being on the road for years and years at a time, as you know, it really wears you out. So yeah. you know, I've, been, I've been living in San Diego for about 10 years. I love it here. And, um, you know, so it's expensive, some, though. It is very, you know, you pay for the beauty. That's for sure. Yeah. One of my um, favorite thing. I don't know if you drink at all, but I love Modern Times Brewery, man. San I Diego. don't drink anymore, but I'm familiar with a lot of them. Um, uh, Johnny from Avenged Sevenfold just had a uh, a beer tasting thing the other night in uh, Huntington Beach. Okay. And, um, I don't know. They had his his beer and everything. I don't know if it's going to be something on the market or if it was just for a promotional thing or what. But that I can cool. be the judge of that. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I like Please. beer. I love it all now. It's chained in this little... You know, before you go for your wine tasting, fuck that. Now you do the beer tastings and it's great fun. I love it. So when I go down to San Diego, I, and people. then also now you've got Lyft and Uber and stuff, you know, so there's no reason not to, to have a few beers. I'm not too much of a lush is the real truth, but I do enjoy a little bit of tasty, tasty. So for sure. For sure. Yeah. San Diego has got a lot of great breweries. Stone, oh, God. Belch so and Beaver. Super good. Tons of them. Tons anyway. For the poor guy who doesn't drink anymore. We're going to focus on beer. I don't know. It's kind of silly, but was it good to hang out with the event sevenfold, dude? Oh, you know what? You know what I got to say about those guys is I was, um, they were out with me uh, on their first tour right after Wharf, I think. And um, the first album cycle. And they're, yeah, I see them, you know, every time they tour. And now that I'm, you know, here, I see them more. But um, they're really the same great guys they always were. They, they haven't changed a bit. I they just have that. unlimited beer now. <laughs> pretty much you know i mean i can say the same about the lamb of god guys you know they are just as genuine of cool guys as they were the first time i ever met them on their first album cycle so, so that was actually a question so being that you're a complete expert on the rock and roll hall of fame do you think lamb of god is going to be accepted into the hall of fame oh i don't know about expert that's for sure not not even close but um you know i would love to see them they're my friends i'd love to see them in the hall of fame you know it's kind of a, a catch-22 at the rock hall of fame you know because um just knowing what I know, it's like, actually, so, it. all, so I'm joking around, but what did you, so you, what did you do? How did you get involved in that? In the rock hall? Yeah. What was your role? What, what, what happened? Uh, I was uh, one of the videographer people. I ordered a lot of the video stuff and I took care of stuff in the store in the video realm. And um, I got to uh, show a lot of artists around. I got to show Joey, um, Joey Ramon around the, uh, the rock hall for four hours. And wow. uh, just me and him. So what did Joey Ramon think was cool? he he doesn't really he didn't really like corporate stuff but he he thought that there was some cool things in there they had some ramon stuff in there and you know we reminisced about that <laughs> did, he run, did he like run through the journey section it's just <laughs> What's that? the journey section the kansas section he's just like <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's uh charlie watts drums why don't you go on hit those you know yeah but it, it was a really great time it was a magical time because everybody that was anybody came there in the first year or two you know yeah so I, I met so many people but i also was um had my my mind opened up to a lot of music that I I kind of liked but didn't really know well enough and I really got educated in a lot of different types of music working there which was really cool That's so I can't say I'm not a metalhead I'm not a this I'm not a that I love everything in its own way I'll you know what I consider good in whatever realm it is but I did learn a lot about music there that I wouldn't have learned on the road or anything you know and like like Marco will attest when you're on the road and and doing this stuff they're really now there may be but there was really never a school or anywhere to go to learn this you know a lot of it was uh yeah just wing it you know um yeah. fortunately for me um i had some incredible mentors that helped me through the years mark O'Shea being one of them for sure top of the list i mean um i worked with uh do stole bon arthur spivak in los angeles uh, wow. when they had their management together um they were both great Stu was from cleveland originally Mm -hmm. uh, Bill Ockwain, I got to work with, who managed Kiss back in the day. Uh, he was managing a band called Crossbreed out of Florida. And um, I got to know him through that tour. And then he died a couple years later. Sorry. But, um, yeah. you know, Steve Popovich from Cleveland, another one. Wow. Huge influence in the business. You know, uh, we almost started a, a small label together. And when I was managing Mushroom Head, uh, we, were on, we were about to sign with Universal and he had made us an offer, but the guys weren't really interested in it. And I was like, oh. But then I got the answer to the universal thing. So it worked out for a while, for a couple of years, a couple of albums. Yeah. All right on, man. And so Tony's, then, uh, do you he think he, he was a good, another influence as well? Cleveland. Who's that? Tony Sula. Tony, yeah, Tony, right. Yeah, yeah, you know Tony well. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
So as a music expert, do you think Nine Inch Nails is music, Trent? Do I think Nine Inch Nails is music? Absolutely. Okay, good. <laughs> we, we can keep them around, Mark. We can yeah, keep okay. them around. Oh, my God. Yeah. Jesus. Yeah. How lucky. Oh, there's a lot of great stuff. You know, what was interesting is that, uh, so I, I was uh, I was touring with STP and Disturbed was going to come on the bill, and I remember hating Disturbed. Uh I actually, I never hated them. I watched them on TV and I thought, what a pile of crap. Sorry, Trent, what are you saying? Were you on that tour with Maxi? Yeah, yeah, I was, yeah. So <laughs> actually, we did. aired one of the episodes, Maxi and, uh, and Frank. I was, oh, yeah, I was such a dick to him. It's, it's easy to be I like an asshole Maxie. when you're in your house. With who? I toured with Maxi. Which tour did you guys do? Manson. Oh, all right. Yeah, he did Manson for years. Yeah, yeah he did. Yeah, he's my buddy. I love that guy, man. <laughs> he always picks up my calls all the years. He'll always pick up the call. But uh, they, 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 they threw on the TV. It was MTV still. And they, they threw on this band called Disturbed. And I'm like, what a pile of crap. You know, <laughs> this is not music. This is a blah, 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 blah. And I do this whole thing in front of everybody. Sure enough, the next band opening up for STP was Disturbed. <laughs> and, then, and so it was kind of like, well, that was awkward. And it was like a week later, too, or a couple weeks later. But what I remember is when you see these guys perform, it's such a different vibe than what you expect on the TV set. So like a mushroom head was where I was kind of going with it. But, uh, you know, less lighters in the air. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but there's like this energy that's totally different. It keeps it interesting, you know, to keep going. So mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's like, like that yeah. element of 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 like with mushroom head they wear you know costumes and masks and everything like you know similar to like well dare i say slipknot and they're whatever but mushroom um, head cut their own path man from day yeah, they, they, there's a mystique about one. these kind of bands you know but like, they worked their fucking ass off that's what i remember they did. yeah as yeah. well as well as you supposed to sit up to serve when i was living in chicago for three years it was just before they popped and you'd see those guys at every show handing out their CD samplers. Yeah. Who was it? Disturbed? All of them. All of them. Yep. You'd see them at the Metro. You'd see them at the South Side Clubs. You'd see them at the North Side Clubs. Such good guys. All you know, the it's, shows it's handing fun. out it's, their CDs. It's hard not to like a band when they're cool as fuck. <laughs> and all <laughs> those guys were just the nicest dudes. It was Godsmack, Disturbed, and, uh, and then the STP. And it was the same with the Godsmack guys. So, like, we did this tour where everybody was a bro. There wasn't a single guy who was a douchebag. So, speaking of, like, working your ass off to get going, I read here that Trent was working in a recording studio called Right Track, and he was cleaning the toilets. Well, yes. I love that. Did but, you know him back then? Yes, I did. So, I to jump back, how did you initially meet because basically your your career began by well, meeting these guys i think or no not, not really no okay um when when i graduated from college in 1985 i had a shitty job what was your degree uh sociology and then a minor in political science okay I wanted to be a lawyer but that didn't work out i ended up breaking more laws than saving more laws so the, you got to break them before you learn what they are. That makes you a better oh, yeah, lawyer. Yeah, yeah. You could be a lawyer yeah. one day. Yeah, exa exactly. Yeah. So um, I went to audio engineering school and um, came back and tried to find a gig in a studio. Couldn't find a gig in a studio. Started mixing for alternative bands and punk bands. Then um, started, you know, seeing lots of bands at different shows. And I started to work with the synth band guys, um, kind of like as a road crew guy. Um, I didn't- When you were mixing for those guys, were you a local or were you van? Were you in a van? No, no, we were local, all local. Okay. There was right. a very, in the late, in the late eighties, um, there was a very vibrant local scene in Cleveland. Okay. Um, bands could play Back then, it's, here's the other weird thing. Band, local bands would come out, like a band like the Adults, Trent, would yeah. come out and they would play starting a set at 1030 and they'd go to like one, they'd take a half hour break and then they'd play all, and then they would go all the way till two. They'd play like two or three sets a night and they would yeah. be the only entertainment. So let me, let me get real quick here though. So yeah. 
I just, I started working for bands and I'm, some bands I roadied for, some bands I mixed for. So you're learning how to do tech work, you're learning how to do audio work. So as I started working for a couple of these uh, synth bands, Trent was just like a keyboard player, like, you know, like, you know, come join the band and, and play some stuff. And then, um, then he was in another band and he was in another band. So we'd always see each other. And okay. then if I, if I wasn't working with the band he was working for, I'd see him as a, as a stagehand. I'd say, hey, dude, hey, dude. So I was like, hey, what's going on? So then he came up to me one day through, uh, actually John mom and him came up to me one day and said, hey, um, we were shopping demos and um, if we were ever to get a deal, would you want to come out on the road with us? I go, are you silly? I'm from Cleveland. I should be the only guy going on the road with you. <laughs> I, know, I know exactly how you think and, and what you want to do. So, and there is an advantage to that and Trent will verify that, that, you so, know, it, it makes a big difference to have your tour manager from your part of the country. Anyway, cause you get all the jokes. So um, he then the TVT deal came through and then we're like, okay, we're gonna, John mom comes up and says, hey, we're gonna send you out on the road to do 10 or 12 shows. And that was it, bam, it just, it just took off. Like crazy took off. That was an exciting time. I remember that, that was cool. It was nuts and, and, and it went from that that intro we were talked about my brother's van yes it was very exciting and then like we went out with so that tour that we did in in uh the fall slash winter that was 89 and then we got the opportunity to go out and open for the jesus and mary chain and then we came home for a two-week break and then right out back again with peter murphy when we did those tours we took a van and a U-Haul out to the Jesus and Mary chain tour. And then they put our gear in their truck. Okay. They were the nicest guys you could ever possibly imagine. And we ended up hiring two of their, two of their crew, almost three of their crew when it came time. So, so then, Reznor, Reznor was a stagehand at one point. No, no, he was playing in a band and I would be, I would be, I'd see it. Okay. And, and then, and then when I was working for Belkin productions as a runner, I would go to Pi keyboards and have to buy things or get things or get stuff fixed. And he was the keyboard genius at Pi. So I'd walk right in, right, right home to him and say, hey, uh, White Snake's e, uh, Emacs is acting up. And he'd go, hold on, he'd take it in the back and fiddle around with it and fix it and give it back to me. And then they'd ring me up for repairable and I'd drive back to the Coliseum with it. So, so it was did always- Did you do White Snake too? No, no, no. I was working You're a runner a bringing it there. Runner, yeah. I was working for okay. Belkin Productions. Stagehand work, audio work, runner work. So I'm, I'm, learning, I'm learning how to walk the walk and talk the talk. So we just always would see each other. And then it came time to tour. And then it was just, it was a match made in heaven. And I, I would have killed for the guy and he would have killed for me. And here's the cool thing about, about Trent Reznor. Yeah. Every bit of success that he's earned or that he has, he's earned it. There's not a doubt in my mind. He's never been a member of the Milwaukee Sperm Club. He always worked his ass off. He, and here's the other thing. I remember, I said, what is it that, 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 that motivates people to want to be around him or work for him? He would never ask you to do something that he can't do himself or wouldn't do himself. Thus the washing of the toilets. You know? I mean, yeah. Bart Coster would say, hey, you're really talented in this studio. You're really great. I need a second engineer to come in on this session. Show up at 1030. He'd be there till four in the morning. And then he'd say, hey, Bart, can I work on some stuff when you're gone? He'd say, yeah, sure you can. Here's the keys. And he'd work on stuff at night. Do you know if that guy ever listened to any of the stuff he was working on? Who, Bart? Yeah. Do you think he liked it? Oh, or? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Sure. It's such a cool story. You know, it's such a great, like, princess story come true i don't know he's not a princess is the only no, but, thing come, but I mean, it's very very the point joel is that he worked his ass off he, he definitely was never lazy ever he worked yeah. i mean constantly like when we were out in la we were preparing for the downward spiral tour they're literally mixing the record and finishing the record and doing remixes and coming up with a b-side for a single and then he's rehearsing with the band for six hours a day and then he's in the studio with with um sean and then the house engineer for another 10 
Yeah, serious they work, hours. They work, their, they work their balls off. I mean, so I, I, that's why, and that's the way we are from Cleveland, man. It was like, you know, like steel mill boys, let's go, you know. Yeah, go hard or go home. Every, yeah, everybody worked really hard here and everybody got along and then somewhere along the way it got weird, but. You're still in Cleveland, Mark? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm the production manager for a small promoter. Right. And right now at the moment, we I do production management for two, two festivals. Our, um, just so you know, our tenure with the Goodyear Theater ended. Okay, they sorry. Have, they, they have sent, building ownership has decided, well, things all changed to COVID and building management finally said, hey, we can't keep you guys on if nothing's happening. We're going to shut the theater down temporarily until we figure out what we're going to do. So then the contract came up for renewal and we didn't renew. And I, I still think they're trying to figure out what they're what they're going to do. So they might renew. I mean, you've got a lot of acts that need venues. So yeah, we so, know, we know. Yeah, we know. you know, there's there's three people that can. There's three entities in Cleveland that can get agencies on the phone. Yeah, Live Nation, AEG, and Elevation Group. You know, my boss Denny Young talks to agents all day long. Yeah, all day long. So anyway, <laughs> let's 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 let's. Drop nine inch nails for a minute. No talk, more nine inch nails. Okay. And talk We're about how, how awesome you know, and uh, my my buddy Trent Weller is. So. Trent, are you really awesome? Yes, because you think about where he's come from. Yeah, you know I mean it's like, I see Trent's journey is, is amazing because he started off as a writer and an interviewer and running his own magazine, and then all of a sudden he just goes, okay, exit stage right. And stage right was. So I'm an art dealer. I love Raymond Pettibone. And I did look up your magazine and the cover art was fucking cool. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, there was a guy who definitely was working for you. I'm assuming here doing some of the cover art. Who's that guy? That'd be Derek Hess. He's a very famous artist. Bad ass. In the Louvre in, the Louvre in Paris. Um, <clears throat> he's in Cleveland. He's from Cleveland. And uh, oh, here. He does great, great work. And he's done a lot of album covers and posters and <clears throat> all kinds of stuff. And his stuff is really bomb. It's oh, really dude, some of those, some of those, they were you had it, they were great covers, man. <laughs> and then that's like, you know, that's why I like the Pettibone stuff. You're 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 bringing back a genre. It gives you the giddy, you know, going back to the punk music that Mark was talking about. You know, it's that mm -hmm. scene. So what made you have the panache because panache is a great fucking journalist word <laughs> to uh, decide to make your own magazine. Uh, you know, a few things. I mean, before I forget, Rob Zombie did a piece of art for my magazine at the time. He did a sticker and paid for it and we gave it away free in our magazine. And I still have those. And they're showing up on the internet, but they're kind of expensive. But I just wanted to throw that out there. No, kind of neat. So what's on the sticker? Uh, it's a zombie face. Pretty much I don't think I have it right here somewhere did you straight. did you hear so he's going to be directing the monsters they're doing a monsters yeah, reboot should be cool that should be like cool. an a right it'd be totally cool man he, he, he said he's seen each episode of the monsters 17 times but because 17 is an odd number you're like i bet he fucking wrote it down <laughs> <laughs> he's a genius i like him too he's, he's a cool cat right he's just all over the place with like neat stuff he's a good dude so I don't know. I love the monsters. I'm all in, man. I'm like, yeah, I will check them. it out for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, right. I guess as far as like how it happened, um, it's kind of weird because um, I was always a fan of music, of course, rock and roll and everything. And um, I was managing some bands um, at the time. And uh, I was actually interning at Beach with Studios during the Dirty Dancing soundtrack sessions with Jim Demain, actually. And um, I had a friend. I had a so it's, uh, what's the what's the one with Swayze? Uh, she's like the wind. <laughs> <laughs> See that I look on her face. <laughs> a band called Liquor Sweet, and they um they needed a promo pack and photos and all kinds of stuff. And I met this girl Brenda, who I ended up doing the magazine with, and she was doing uh, Promosphere Unlimited, and it was basically she was putting together bios and photos and all this stuff for uh, for bands, you know, and had a photographer and all that. So. We hired her and we did that and she and I became friends and got to know each other and um, she felt that I knew a lot, you know, about the business and stuff and we were, um, you know, we, we grew up reading Scene Magazine in Cleveland and um, Alternative Press, which is huge, it's still from Cleveland, I believe, yeah. and um, 
we were influenced by them totally. And we thought there was a little bit of a niche where we could come in and do like some heavier stuff and underground stuff and alternative stuff that wasn't really being covered by the other magazines, um, so to speak. And so um, Brendan and I had a, a situation where we came into some money and we decided to go for it. And I mean, when we were doing that magazine, it was cut and paste, man. We did not have the technology you have today at all. We yeah. had a Mac computer. We had a Mac with floppy disks. We would go to Kinko's to print it out on the laser printer so that we could cut and paste it until six in the morning. It had to be at the printer at eight in the morning and then we'd be out the next day, you know, but it was a monthly and it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of people that way, you know. So you yeah. know, it was it was a great way for kids in the scene to, to get educated. You know, yeah, a lot of it was, it was, you got to remember, this is this is BC era. This is before computer, man. It's like the only way, like the only way I found out about the clash in the late 70s and the 80s before I went to college was from the magazines. Yeah. So, and magazines were important. It was important that you got names right, the stories right, the label right. And I mean, for the audiophiles, me, I'm still an audiophile. I mean, that was like Bible, Bible mm -hmm. stuff. This big, I just remembered this. Um, I was interviewing Alice in Chains. They were on tour of Screaming Trees at the Cleveland Agora on the oh, dirt yeah. tour. And oh, it was awesome. But wait to hear this. So, Johan, a friend of ours that passed away from the Agora, unfortunately, mm. um, he knew I was there and he made sure that I got clearance to go and meet the people that were waiting for me, blah, blah. And uh, I finished the interview and I had my little mini tape recorder thing that I took everywhere when I did interviews. And <clears throat> my friend was like, You should start recording shows at that. I'm like, I tried one and all I got was, you know, so <laughs> I had that in my pocket and I had brought an extra tape in case the one ran out, but I only got 30 minutes. So it all fit on one tape. So <clears throat> as I was leaving, um, Johan's just like, find me uh, when you're done and uh, you know, come to the office, say hi, blah, blah, blah. So was, I'm on my way through the arena. They're getting ready to sound check on the way to Johan's office. And I hear sound check starting. And I was like, oh, this sounds really cool. And they told that there's nobody allowed in the room. Nobody was allowed to be around. They shut the doors, locked them and everything. So what did I do? Because I used to work there and I knew. I ran upstairs um, to the balcony and I hid behind a chair and I recorded the whole sound check. And because it's so awesome, I put it underneath my shirt so that it wouldn't get that staticky thing, you know? And uh, so now I just need to get that onto a, like a CD or something. I just found it recently, but it's really, really good. Get in touch and with the guys. That, which band is that? What's that? That's Alice in Chains? Wow. On the dirt tour, the sound check. I mean, they did down damn this river, rooster. Uh, they did so you, you listen you listen to it recently? No, because I'm afraid to play it. I'm not touching it. I, I was to gonna my, say, dude, you're gonna get chills. You're I uh, mean my, my friend in Hollywood, he, he's big time now. He's uh, got his own production company. He's in Game of Thrones, he's doing that Paradise City or whatever it is. His name is Lorenzo Antonucci. He used to be in Sworn Enemy. Okay. You remember them? But uh yeah, I got a, I got a lot of stuff for him that I have to get done in a, I'm hoping. Just yeah, take it to a proper house, place yeah. and have him transfer yeah, it. I was told and by a lot of people, don't do anything yet. Wait till you're around the right people with the right equipment because you don't want anything to happen to it. And I actually have a lot of stuff like that, not just Alice and Chain. Did you re-record over your interviews? Was that? Did you ever did you ever re-record over your I, interviews? I, I, a couple times it was on accident. Wow. Um <clears throat> the thing that really bums me out is that uh <clears throat> excuse me, about 80% of my interviews that were on cassettes and tapes and whatnot, Brenda still had. So when she passed, I don't really know what happened to a lot of them. And that really oh, God, what a bummer. amazing ones. You yeah. see those on all those compilations nowadays, like old interviews, like yeah. The Clash put a couple of their interviews yeah. on their yeah. compilations yeah. about yeah. 10 years ago. Steve Weiland, Chris Cornell, Paul Stanley, everybody, dude. I mean, I got, I was so blessed to do all the things I did from whether it was the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, the magazine, the touring, like I've been really blessed, I swear. I, and I, I don't I don't sit there and say, oh, I'm lucky because I, I worked really hard to get what I got, you know? Yeah. But, um, I love the business and I, you know, I'm never going to leave it. You know, I might, I might get bored after 10 years of doing something to move on, but, and I've done that a lot, but you know what? It's all right. I've, I've, I've mastered everything I've done almost. So I think maybe one more time out on the road, one or two more towards me. No, yeah, no, that's what the, I mean. Who's that's your all. Gig wisely? Yeah. yeah, if you have trouble finding somebody, I have audio engineer buddies here in LA. They'll transfer it for you. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, 
that. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Sure, for sure. Yeah, because I mean, I found it's totally random, but I found a tape. It was a micro cassette tape of my grandparents. I interviewed them in elementary school, right? And I wow. totally wanted to know what was on the tape, so my buddy transferred it for me. And it, it's very cool to hear. You know, you're reminiscent about your past when you hear that. I, oh, yeah. I think you'll have a visual of you sitting there in the place like, man, this is so cool. And I hope I don't get fired, but this is really cool. My grandparents and my parents would exchange cassettes of us talking to each other. It was kind of crazy, but yeah, it was cool. That's really neat. So do you still have a, a pension or an interest in, uh, in journalism? Are, are, are you an avid uh, reader of magazines and whatnot now? I mean, everything's online so much, but still. Yeah, you know what? I, I love and hate technology. It's a catch-22 for me because, you know, growing up without a lot of the technology half your life and then the other half having to, you know, having the technology, it's kind of weird. I, I, I mean, anything's possible as far as what, what I might do. Um, and I'm open to everything, but, yeah. um, you know, it's, it is what it is. I mean, everything kind of has fallen into my lap, to be honest with you. I haven't had to really chase too many you know, gigs. So I've been very, long. Oh, I don't know. I think you're a go-getter. Come on. You start your own man, in the newspaper. I don't, maybe that's a lot of work. <laughs> work hard, no matter what it is. You know? So when you first started though, were you just dropping them off at locations, just going and, and, or how did you start getting distribution? How does that work? Well, I think I'm going to let the cat out of the bag, but I don't care. It's, it's years ago, but we hired the guy that had the biggest magazine in Cleveland do our distribution. <laughs> you did see magazines distribution. And so he helped us out. And then we hired some other people um, and we didn't have money to pay these people. We gave them like concert tickets, the opportunity to meet bands, you know, passes and free CDs and posters and autographs and shit like that. We never, you know, expected anything free from anybody. Everybody else paid for everything. Yeah, but I think like the back then, the community, it was a community thing. You know, do it, do it here. Talk to this guy. Talk to this guy. Give this guy. I mean, yeah. you more the merrier. Go for it. You know, yeah. brothers in arms type feel. Yeah, it's time to change, you know crazy but yeah uh, yes no you know so this podcast thing there's not really money in it so all these podcast guys i'm in a couple groups and they're like oh yeah dude go for it you know and they're they're very nice to each other because you're not fighting for anything it's not like anyone's making anything out of it so it's just fans so it's been kind of fun i got some new friends who who kind of who tell you this and that and show you the way because it's hard to understand how you know mic work i'm never a sound guy i don't know shit so I got two comments for you guys. And one goes back to, to you, Trent, is um, um, a couple of, well, about three months ago, I got a, a, um, a nice little iPad. And it was, um, it was um, given to me as, as, as somebody had too many of them and just goes, here, take this. <laughs> so I, I signed up for Apple News Plus. And as part of my Apple home subscription for TV and music, which, oh my God, I'm constantly getting new music all the time. Um, and you can go in there and pick and choose the magazines that you want to subscribe to. And I have never read as many magazines in the last two months than I have in the last five years, because now I can get to them all. Yeah. <laughs> just read and just like yeah. read and it's great it's wonderful it's it's really really awesome i find it stimulating for my brain mm -hmm. and um the other thing what we were just talking about before i, I butt it in <laughs> <laughs> we we're talking about uh his magazine and then i was i was saying how the podcasters are really oh, uh, helpful with the, one the, here's the thing joel if you're not doing this kind of stuff and guys are you are not doing this kind of stuff you're not capturing the legacy. Yeah, I kind Too of feel... many musicians are dying off. Yeah. Too yeah. many road crew guys are dying off. And then people wonder what happened. Where did they go? What was that gig like? Yeah. What was it like to record that record? What was it like to sit in with that guy in that session? It's 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 I mean. Think about some of the icons of the early rock and roll history. The only guy left, ironically, is Jerry Lee Lewis. So I did. Did you watch that interview with David Morgan, Three Dog Night? No. No, so I, he he was a he was a he played keys on separate tours with Jerry Lee Lewis, with Little Richard, and with Ray Charles. <laughs> and he had great stories about each of them. And you know, you're, we were just sitting there 
very quiet. <laughs> it went for two guys and a half like hours. That, just guys like that should be sitting down in front of a camera with somebody like you, Joel, for for twenty hours, like five five two hour sessions. They were so good. I mean, after two and a half hours, I did. I wanted more. He almost had me crying, like for real. I was and you know I'm tough. I mean, look at me. <laughs> <laughs> you know who's going to tell the stories about all the famous people that have died in the last three years no one that's true, that's true man and there's been a lot of it i i kind of think of it in a way of like in the early 1920s chronicling all those blues singers that just disappeared you know how right. a blind willie mctell i'm a fan of can you imagine having an interview with that guy for an hour oh it would have been wow. magic magic but you know for me i mean I'm meeting new people too. I'm being, I'm being very selfish in my own way. I'm meeting a bunch of good guys, hearing fun stories and, and, and remembering certain things. So with like nine inch nails, I remember certain things from my youth and uh, a pretty girl <laughs> who liked her nine inch nails a lot. That's the one that stands out the most, by the way, <laughs> What's that? Which oh, one? Some, some girl I dated for five minutes who loved nine inch nails. So you put nine inch nails on and she'd be all, she'd be all excited. So, so I love me some nine inch nails. <laughs> <laughs> very selfish reasons again very selfish reasons but uh, uh trent would be happy to hear that story yeah tell him thank you man i love that yeah. guy i used to Great. hear so we were on the right he he lived in new orleans right or did does no he left he's back he's been back in la for a number of years <clears throat> I um, ironically that. i think he got out of there The season before the flood. Yeah. Uh, before Katrina. I just, I remember I he that. was like friendly with Ann Rice and they'd have epic parties. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I think I love, I love it, you know? <laughs> I got a funny Ann Rice story and Trent Reznor story for you. Okay. So, so I think his attorney that was in LA helping him get settled in court, um, settled in and looking after him and helping him out was, I, believe her name was something like, or I believe it was exactly Jackie McPherson or something like that. Okay. And Jackie McPherson was this New Orleans lady through and through. And uh, so one particular, oh, the 4th of July, 1995, we decided, boy, wouldn't it be a really great idea if we went and spent hundreds of dollars on fireworks? <laughs> Like every band does. So we went and bought hundreds of dollars in fireworks. And we started lighting them off in the parking lot opposite the studio. Then the cops came and said, you guys can't do that. Okay, dude, thanks, man. Then I think we snuck back into the studio. We went and we were up on the roof. Then, well, they, they won't find us on the roof. So we're lighting off fireworks off the roof. Then the cops go, guys, we're just here. Stop doing it. So then Trent has this idea. Let's get in the minivan. Marco, go get the minivan and we'll go drive somewhere else and light off fireworks. <laughs> on our way to light, on our way somewhere else to light off fireworks, he goes, stop here. And it was some on some street. He goes, stop here. I go, okay. And he goes, he goes, he goes, get out. I go, okay. He goes, he goes, here, he throws me a bolt of fireworks. He goes, a firecrackers. He goes, here, light those. So I put them on the tree line and I light the belt of firecrackers and they drove off. <laughs> and I'm standing there and all of a sudden, pop, 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 pop. So I'm standing there and then just somebody comes out of this house and walks out of the porch, standing there. It's fucking Ann Rice. She's looking oh, at me and I go, oh. I go, Trent made me do this. <laughs> and she and walks back inside. <laughs> I love it. And then they came back and got me a couple minutes later. But yeah, it's like, that's his sense of humor. That's, that's, that's all, that's Midwestern. So I got a, a friend. Did you guys ever tour with Carrie Charbonneau? She's a roadie. She was with yeah. Dave Matthews for a long time. So, so she's recently been moving. I helped her move. And so I was helping her move and she had her little dog with her. And I had to go pick up something for my girlfriend. And I, and so, and so Carrie got out to go walk the dog. And I'm like, I'm going to leave her here. And I, I'm just laughing my ass. And she gets in the car. She goes, why are you fucking laughing? Because <laughs> I was going to leave you up here in the middle of nowhere. I thought it'd be so funny. But it was like, I would never do that to any human being, but a roadie. <laughs> and she was, I'm really glad you wouldn't. Have, I would have kicked your fucking ass. I'm like, I wouldn't have cared. I was thorough that I was going to leave you. <laughs> and I was, but she caught me. She kind of looked over at me and she saw me laughing and then she came back to the car <laughs> oh i do God. have one question all right so i toured with a fella he told me in the store so actually i toured with robin too because i was on nine inch nails so with robin fink so you toured with robin on downward spiral or yeah yes 
I was told, or how did he get into the band? Do you know the story? Yes. Okay. I, so I believe the story goes, the call went out for auditions to be in the band. Um, so um, through, a, through a whole network of people, whether it was Susie Zimmerman calling somebody or Jerry Girard, the agent calling someone, or John Mom calling someone, the call went out for people to audition for the band. Then I think it, it, it happened through a process of VHS tapes, auditions. Okay. So you so far audition. the story is the same as the one I've heard from the roadies, but okay. I'm sorry? I said so far the story is the same as the one I've heard, so. Right. So the, um, the audition tapes all come in and they're out in LA and the guys are at the Tate house, I believe, and they're watching the videotapes and, and they pop in this videotape of this guy, Robin Fink. And um, they're watching it all of a sudden they're like, he was playing guitar. <laughs> he was playing guitar naked. He was auditioning for the band, playing the guitar naked with this wild dreadlock hairdo, and Trent goes, call him. <laughs> that's the story. And I heard that Trent got up and goes, boys, that's our next guitar player. <laughs> and and that's and that's Trent. He, he, he's got that sense of humor. He's like, that, that's it. I, I want the guy. So that's and, a true story, man. I thought yeah, Robin was... Fink used to be in that band from um, Atlanta called the Impotent Sea Snakes. Okay. Robin was an original member of the Impotent Sea yeah. Snakes. And actually, I think that, I believe, I know there was one, I thought the co-owners of the Masquerade during that great yes. era were both guys called Dean. Yeah. And Dean was one of the members of the Impotent Sea Snakes. Yeah. So I think Jerry Girard was calling clubs and saying, hey, we're going to hold auditions. Anybody who think that would fit in. So I think Dean from the Impotent Sea Snakes, even though he didn't want to lose them, says to Robin Fink, hey, make an audition tape. I'll get it to the booking agent and they'll send it out to LA. And I believe it, that's kind of how it happened or that's exactly how it happened. That's and they great. watched that tape and I was like, that's our man. <laughs> that's our man. I wonder why he did it. I should have asked him when I- uh... Well, Robin just- Yeah, he walks his own path, I know. He definitely is. He's a sweetheart though. He's a super, yep. super nice man. He, he was really, I spent quite a bit of time with him in uh, Rock and Rio and- uh with guns and he was such a nice guy he's such a he's, class act he's, he's just, yeah all i gotta say i mean i you know you know the nickname trent gave to him queenie yeah that was his nickname queenie everybody had a nickname why was queenie i don't know i think it may have something to do with like we had we had no idea which way which side of the field Robin played on? So I didn't know if I should go there or not. So that was the other story. No, because I think Robin may be one of those guys. My impression was just like, hey, if it comes, if it does, it does. I don't really care. I was told, so they would go to strip clubs and Robin would just sit there at the, at the thing, just bored. He'd just mm -hmm. be sitting there. And then they'd be throwing women and this girl's just vagina right in your face and be like, yeah, just don't get it. Totally don't see what you're looking at here. And he'd get up and leave. And I can visualize him doing it. And I think it'd be so fucking funny from him, you know? But he did marry. He is married to a woman. On the Downward and, Spiral yeah. Tour, he would, he would pass most nights on the antics and go back to the hotel and play guitar. Now, Trent told the guys early on, this, is, this was as the tour was getting going and getting developed for the downward spiral. He said, I want you guys to write music while you're on the road. I want you to come up with ideas. Robin was the only one who, who bought a road case and in the road case was this tiny little four track. And I think he had a little tiny drum machine and a couple guitar pedals and a cable. And it looked like uh, three quarters of a flight case for a bass. Not necessarily lo that long, but it was like as tall and then as thick and, you know, so it looked like a, a flight case for a bass guitar got a third of it got cut off. And in there was his little studio with his headphones and then he'd bring a guitar up off the bus. And when he checked into a hotel, that case, a guitar and his luggage would move up to his room. Yeah, he, he was the same. He didn't ever change on guns. He was the same. He was very serious about his job.
Very and, serious. Uh, fantastic guitar player, too. He would do such strange things always. I don't Trent know. pushed him. Trent pushed him really hard. And I think Robin would probably say that. Trent used to say to him, you need to work harder. Right, create something different. That's great. You're on the right path, but give me something that's completely wacky. And I remember him saying to Robin, there was a brief conversation somewhere, and he said, What kind of music do you listen to? And Robin's like, oh, I don't know, this and then the other. So the next day, Trent went to the music store and he came back and he gave him six CDs. And he said, Listen to these and listen to them and listen to them thoroughly and all the time, listen to these. And one of them was an Alice Cooper CD. Oh. One of them was the Rise and Fall of Ziggy Sardust. Oh, yeah. And I don't remember the other ones. But he, I mean, you know, because I don't think Robin was very familiar with those bands at the time. But you toured with David Bowie, too? I toured with um, Nine Inch Nails when they toured with Bowie. Right. Bowie's class act. Talk about a neat dude. It's pretty cool. I just, I just posted those photos. Yeah. You yeah, did. I saw and that's that actually from, I saw that, that was today. From the blossom date. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I I on that tour, I was I graduated to tour accountant. And so then because the nails were the opening act or the middle act, they didn't need a tour manager. There was no need for one. And most of our money we got we're getting paid a flat trend and our PC was uh, based on number of tickets sold. So it was very important for me to know the status of every sellable seat in the venue. So then I turned into tour accountant. So then I started traveling with the crew. So then they, because of Jerry Gerard, the agent was on the tour and Jerry Meltzer, the security guy was there. They just found the minder. So if there's four, five guys in the band, there were three people looking after the band party. It was ridiculous. So they were well taken care of. So I went out on that tour and part of my job was I led you guys, the photographers, in and out of the building for both sets. You were brought in for um, the beginning of Trent's set, and then you'd leave, and then you were brought back in for the collaborative set. So and cool. then you would stay um, for two or three songs in the Bowie set, and then I, along with Bowie's security guy, would walk everybody back out of the building. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. I mean, it was the, the, so they were like, you know, the, the nail security guy was like way too busy. So I just said, well, you know, during that time of the show, I'm not doing anything. So they got me one of those headsets with a microphone and I'd bring the photographers in, I'd take them out, I'd bring them back in again. And then Bowie's guy would get them out of the building. You know, it was neat when, uh, if you're in Cleveland and you have your laminate, at least it used to be, they'll let you in. If you're a roadie, you get in for free. So we'd go and check it out. And I went in with a woman named Helen and they had a David Bowie exhibit at the time. And it was neat because she had worked for Bowie. And so she'd go through, she'd be like, I fixed that hat right there. I fixed that myself. And uh, that one right there. <laughs> and you're going through, it was what so was neat. Last name? I don't recall. She's English. When was this? I toured with her in 99. Helen Campbell. That's Helen Campbell. Exactly. That's right. And Helen Campbell started with us. Oh really? With nine? Yeah, with she, was, she was uh she was my production assistant. Oh she's fucking great. She was brought to us by Tim Buckley, our production manager who came from U2. Helen was also a U2 guy, a gal person. She was awesome. So she I would go in there and I'd be like Love yeah. that lady. Pardon? Love that lady. She is so good. Yeah, she'd be you know, I'm a kid at the time and it was we'd get the rock doc out and I'm like, I need to get some some cream because I have a rash. I don't give a shit, Rifkin. Don't want to hear it. <laughs> I'm like, no, no, Helen, let me explain. It's nothing kooky. I don't give a fuck. Get the fuck out. Fuck off. I'll, okay. So be like, no, no, listen, I've got a little bit. of <laughs> Smoking her Marlboro lights with her blonde little hair. Yep. Um, I know her well, yeah. She's a great girl. Uh, yeah, she's a great yeah, woman. Yeah. I shouldn't say Helen girl. Campbell. Wow. Small world. Yeah, Helen we Campbell. A lot of great people on the road, man. Love you, wow. Helen. Yeah, that was a wild time. Speaking great. of wild time, I got a good one for you. What do you got? Listen, this involves merchandising. Okay. Um, I don't know if I've shared this story with you or not, Marco. But anyway, um, I did was... You kill, in, did you kill anyone? <laughs> I've, I've told a few people, but... No, did you kill anyone with during the story? Oh, did I kill anyone? No, but I almost... Okay, got go killed. ahead. <laughs> Helen's the one who could hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, was in, um, I was in Europe. <clears throat> we, were in, uh, we were in London, 
uh, we were playing the marquee on a weekend where it was the last weekend of the marquee in Soho. They were moving or something. I don't know. And so we were sandwiched in between these huge gigs, like Oasis played one night, U2 played another night, blah, blah. And here I am with Mushroom Head. <laughs> and so we play in between on like, it was like Saturday, Sunday, Monday. I think we played Sunday or something. Anyway, um, they have different rules over there. And this was like, uh, unbeknownst to me, you know, in the U S a lot of times the bands get really pissed when people are bootlegging their merch and they want to do something about it. And, you know, sometimes they just send their crew guys out and they'll just take shit and just fuck off. You know what I mean? What are you going to do? Yeah. You know, it's illegal, right? Well, it's not illegal over there. <laughs> and, um, so I had the same crew for about a year and a half and we were on Ozfest and all kinds of shit. We went back over there. This was the last night of the tour. And I had arranged for there to be a end of tour party at the hotel. Uh, that'll come into play in a minute but anyway there was these scalpers like crazy all over the place selling the coolest you know merch that I mean, our merch wasn't even this cool you know i was like wow check this out and um my one crew guy was like fuck these guys man let's go take no shit. don't mess those guys will kill you they will they'll stab you oh the trend. trend's guilty look at him <laughs> Oh my God! He locked up right as he was telling the story. He locked up right there. He said he's gonna kill him. That's hilarious! They're gonna cut him off. <laughs> They've been watching him ever since. Yeah. <laughs> I used to like going into the audience or going into the parking lot and getting those shirts and stuff, and I'd wear them around the band, and the band would look like, "Who authorized that? Did we buy that shirt?" And I loved it. I know exactly where his story is going. I was told many, many years ago, do not confront or mess with the bootleggers just lick your wounds and move on well in the other countries yeah they'll fucking kill you i think i mean Absolutely. they're yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't uh, so how did you two meet one another you and uh trent weller here let's go back to my comment earlier yeah about the cleveland scene okay um but you don't remember the exact moment. You just remember. No, I don't. And I, okay. So he's doing a magazine. I'm doing stage crew stuff. I'm doing stage management stuff. I'm doing runner stuff. Right. And it, so you're constantly working. You're constantly seeing the same people. And I'd see Trent and, or some of his writers at meet and greets because they had done an interview or, um, um, they were going to do an interview or review, so they'd always be there. And then um, Mushroom had started to really take off. And um, he said to me, he goes, I think we're going to get a record deal. Oh, my God. I'm like, oh, good, man. Don't get another band from Cleveland. And he goes, oh, it's going to be so much work. And I go, dude, you're just going to be fine. Just be yourself. And don't listen to anybody else to say, oh, you're from Cleveland. Um, don't forget to, let, to bring the cows back into the barn before you uh, jump on your, your business call here. I'm telling you, man. So they um, get their deal. They're starting the tour. They decide to take him, I'm assuming, because he went from management to road management, to take him and put him into the road management position. Well, he called me and he said, hey, I need some help. Yeah. So we would sit down and we, as, as my great mentor did, um, as much as his schedule would allow, we would sit down and we would have like uh, mock settlements. We would, I would tell him about how to do guest list stuff, how to look for people coming in back doors and um, don't take no for an answer when it comes to the band. Um, tell you know, just teaching him and sharing with him everything that I had ever learned. Yeah, And I just said, you're from Cleveland, they're from Cleveland, no one else should be doing this gig, and I will do whatever it takes to yeah. get the gig. So one particular night, I'm in Chicago, and I was living in Chicago and working in Chicago and um, helping another guy run a management company. He was in um, Mushroom Head, but somewhere within like an hour drive. And I just go, oh, yeah, there they are. Okay. So I just, out of the blue, like my mentor did, I just showed up at a gig. And he's like, oh, my God, what are you doing here? And you're <laughs> like, said, I'm taking notes. I'm taking notes. <laughs> I said, I'm checking up on you, buddy. So who was and, your mentor, unless you don't want to say? Oh, not at all. Stuart Ross. Okay. 
And who did he work with? Uh, Stuart Ross was, is, um, if you look under Legends of Tory Accounting or Tory Management, Stuart's one of the top three or four too. And how did you um, meet him? Stuart Ross originally was from Cleveland, Ohio. Ah. Stuart originally worked at the old Agora when it was on East 24th Street off of Chester, not where it is now. Um, and then he, um, uh, I think his story went something like he got picked up by one or two of the bands that used to come through the Agora because like me, he showed promise. He's amazing. He's great. And then he just went out to LA where the, where the work was and made a name for himself. Mm -hmm. And then Stuart was the guy who, when Lollapalooza was put together, was one of the founding members. I think mean, it was Don Muller, Mark Geiger, Perry Farrell, and oh. uh, Ted Gardner, and um, Stuart. And Stuart was the tour accountant. So on that tour is where I first met him. And we got along great. You know, so he made your career. He took you under. He took you right. Under He's plan. like, Mark, you're a guy from Cleveland. I got to make sure you get taken care of. So then um, when we were in pre-production for the Downward Spiral Tour in 94, I went to the Lollapalooza Palooza office three to four days a week for five to six hours. And I was he would just teach me everything I needed to know. We'd go through show files and settlements and you know, he'd say, here's the settlement I went through. Here's how I went through it. Here's how I, here's how I verified all the reasons. I mean, just taught me all of these tricks. Killer. And everything. And then, you know, you're, you're doing these arena settlements and people are like, one guy came up to me one night. He goes, you've got to know Stuart Ross. <laughs> I sure do. And he goes, I can tell. That's an ultimate compliment. Right. And then one, one particular night, Stuart paid me the surprise visit. He just showed up. And then I was kind of like, I was like, oh my God, I'm getting, I'm a little nervous. Like, oh no, oh my goodness. And then he came in, he goes, Mark, when are we going to go settle? And I said, well, we're going to settle when the band goes on stage. Okay, I'll come find you. So we went up to settlement and we're in settlement for like 10 minutes. And then he, you know, and I think one of the people from the promoters team knew him. And at one point he just goes, I'm going to go catch the rest of the show. Mark, you're going to be fine. And he got up and left. Great. And then, and then that, and then he left. I think he went back to his, and he hung out to the end of the show and all that stuff. And then next day flew back to LA and he did that all on his own dime. Oh, what a great story. What He's a, a good great guy. guy. I mean, if you, if you meet any other road managers or tour managers, like, a Jim Rungi or any of those cats that do the tour management one-on-one podcast and, and class, everybody will tell you how amazing Stuart Ross is. Oh, that's cool. I'll have to see if he wants he's to come. Very up. generous. <clears throat> he's very great. He's a legend. He's, he's just, Oh my God. I can't say any, I can't say enough great things about him. I love the man. So I just found out recently that the tour manager is in charge of collecting the money. I never knew that because I, you know, I was a, I was a lighting guy, a carp, and I'm busy getting the shit off the stage. I never knew that was your gig. Yep. Or, or big... you'd have, or you'd have a um, tour account. Again, all dependent on what level of touring that you're doing. At the so time. that's the question. So on the bigger tours, I would imagine. And I would assume, maybe incorrectly, that they wouldn't try to cheat you as often. And I've been told now, so I'm cheating because the guy I spoke to last night was going through this with me, Thomas. Thomas is with Weezer, and yeah. he is the tour manager. So he was explaining. Well, then Thomas knows Stuart Ross. Um, I, he was actually hitting me up all day today. I'll ask him. Thomas yeah, O'Keefe. Thomas will know Stuart Ross. Okay. Sure. So the question is, on the bigger tours, I would assume you negotiate, you figure it out, you get your money. You're doing a van tour with a nine inch nails. I mean, what are you going to do if they're not going to pay you in full? You got a bunch of guys maybe to go into a fight. Never, but I mean had, never, incurred, never encountered that. And I know bands have had those problems, but maybe I'm the lucky, maybe I'm the lucky spudhead that never had to fight for money. I've been, I've had a gun literally pointed at my forehead close at close range and told to leave someone's office because I demanded, I demanded percentage money that he wasn't going to pay. And I said, I'm not leaving this office to you pay us the extra percentage money we earned tonight. And he said, you're taking the balance of your guarantee and you're leaving this office. Or you're not leaving this office at all. And I said, I'm sorry, sir. I can't do that. Yeah. And then he goes like this. 
Is this enough reason? And I was like, okay, I'll see you later. Bye. Fuck that guy, <laughs> though. Yeah, but eventually, long story short, the band got their money because the agent pulled every show. And then a couple other agencies who were friends with this guy pulled shows until that money was wired to our agent. And then everybody put their shows back on. So why do you think a guy like that does that? Is he drunk at the end of the night? Or I mean, you know, yeah, something like that. Yeah. 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 You think you're all tough guy out of nowhere. He well, not out of nuts. nowhere. He probably did all the time. The it's owner of the video works. bar in Dallas, Texas in the summer of 1990. I was actually with Nine Snow. Yeah. Yeah. We caught him counterfeiting tickets. He was, he had extra tickets printed above what Ticketmaster was selling. Wow. And I discovered that by talking to a bunch of fans lined up down the building. I started to see, like, I'm looking at their tickets and I started to see two. I go, that's a Ticketmaster ticket. What's this? This is ticket number 283. What's this? And it was like printed, you know, like old, old printed tickets with a number on it. Wow. So I took, I took the highest one I could find out of the kids and I, and I put their names on the guest list. And then that's when I, I called up our manager and our booking agent on the phone and I had the ticket and I, I, so I went, when I went into his office and I said, look, you sold at least 283 tickets at this amount. And based on the deal, you owe us this amount of money for those extra sales. So what are the guys in line saying? I mean, they must be afraid you're going <laughs> to, you're like, no, no, no. I'll let you're no, going to no, get no, in. They, you know. they, they were cool. They yeah. were cool. And they, you know, I got him in. They were fine. No big deal. All good. I missed you, Trent. It's been tough. I lost you guys there. Sorry. No, Dude, you're good. We had such a great laugh when you disappeared because it was right as you were about to tell this horrible story. And then you went, ah. Yeah. And your face was literally that. Your face was like <laughs> it was this. really like, good. Ah. The way you were talking about those that you, uh, you're you going, in, you're going to get the counterfeit shirts and stuff out of the parking lot or wherever. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we, mushroom know, head. We, we, yeah. We didn't realize it was illegal. So, you know, the, the crew guys were just like, Oh yeah, they did what they always do. They just grabbed them, you know, and they were really cool actually. And they went in and they proceeded to give them to everybody. So everybody's wearing these hoodies and whatever. Right. Didn't think too much about it. And the club manager, I believe, came running asking for me and, and and they're like he's right there and everybody's pointing at me i'm like hey what's up and he says um we gotta talk we gotta talk and i'm like okay and so he pulls me aside and he's like listen he goes i don't know what you guys did he goes but i go oh about the, the the merch and he goes yeah he goes that's not illegal here he goes and the people that run that kind of stuff here are kind of like an underground mafia like there's a lot of it there and it's not illegal so i'm like oh shit i see where he's going with this you know <laughs> so so um, we're trying to figure out what to do. And he, he goes back to the office and we're talking and I, he comes running back and he says, he says, you got to go. And I go, what? And he's like, he's like, you're the tour manager. You're the one they want to see. And I'm like, who? And he's like, the guys that I told you about, they're here. And I'm like, whoa. And then when my um, Danny, my one crew guy comes running, he goes, dude, there's these guys in here and they don't look very happy. And I'm like, oh shit. So they basically. Where are you again? Sorry, where? In, in London, with the marquee. marquee. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, um, and so my guitar player, Marco says to me, he goes, we got to get you out of here, dude. What are we going to do? I go, oh, fuck. And he looks down and there's a big dead drum case, dead meaning empty. Yeah. So they put me in it and I trusted him. I didn't know what was going to go on. I was scared too. I was like, well, so they put me in this road case, they close it. They put me in the, in the elevator, take me down to the truck, put me in the truck and close the truck for about an hour and a half. And they finally came back and got me and um, got me out of the truck and out of the box. And we're laughing like, haha. And then the club manager comes down and goes, uh, they're back. You know, and we're like, oh, you got to be kidding. So <clears throat> all of a sudden, one of those um, those London taxi cars, you know, the black ones that look like those old school cars in the movies come squealing up into the parking garage. And the, and the, the guy pushes me and Marco into the car and he's, he told him our hotel and he took us to our hotel. And I'm thinking, this is ridiculous. Oh, man, what am I going to do? And I got management on the phone, booking agent on the phone, club on the phone, everybody. And we're all trying to figure this shit out. So we go to the, the hotel room. And it, it was the last night of the tour. And I had planned to have a big party in the hotel bar for everybody because we were flying out the next morning. And um, so basically, Marco and I were so freaked out. We, were, we didn't know what to do. So he bleaches his hair. 
we both change our clothes totally. I put on some stupid hat with glasses and all this shit. And then I'm getting calls like, hey, everybody's at the bar. You know, it's your tab. You got to get down here so we can start drinking. So I'm like, all right, we're on our way. We're thinking, oh, we're overreacting, whatever. So we go down there, we go in, everybody's there. Like, ooh, Trent's here. Yeah, drinking time, whatever, you know. So we have a big toast, you know, and having a good time reminiscing about the tour. And all of a sudden, these guys show up at the hotel in the lab. Oh, no. <laughs> well, thank God, the guy from the, the club let the authorities know what was going on. And they showed up, like, basically right after them. And they were in there, and they were looking at the bar, and they were looking at everybody, and, and we're all just like, <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, me and Marco were like, oh, they're going to get us. They're going to get us, you know. But then yeah. we, saw, we saw the cops, and so <clears throat> we flew the fuck out of there real quick the next morning. <laughs> wow. Wow. that's a better story than mine yeah i mean what do you think they would have shaken you down for what do you like a few hundred bucks or who knows i mean he, he he said that he's seen that happen before and they basically waited for him to settle after the show and then they got him then or you know he had a diff, couple different scenarios but yeah i never did that again <laughs> you still have the hoodie no, I didn't take one. I was like, you, with all the merch you get on tour, you guys know? I mean, I, yeah, yeah, I was like, no, not me. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, one question. My buddy's uh, daughter's in fifth grade, and she had her little fifth grade friends over, and I was going to start a podcast. And I said, what should I ask my guests? And so the little girl, she said, you should ask them when they first uh, felt famous. And I actually like the idea that to feel famous doesn't mean you have to be famous. <laughs> doesn't mean you have to be a celebrity. When was the first time you recall feeling uh, successful, important, possibly famous? I don't know, whatever way you want to do it, feeling, feeling like you had some clout. I don't know, something had happened that made you feel good. Well, uh, Mark's in deep thought, so I think we'll start with Trent. Okay. You know, there's several situations I, I can think of, but one would be um, when I was uh, on OzFest with Shadows Fall and we did an off, uh, off day show at the Metro in Chicago and uh, I think it was Guitar Player Magazine came out to do a thing on John, our guitar player, who's now in Anthrax. And um, the theme of the photographer wanted was John jamming in the dressing room and then a tour manager coming in and trying to grab him and say, come on, let's get on stage, you know? So basically he got His a shot manager, such great actors, of course, <laughs> we didn't want to miss that opportunity anyway. So yeah. It was like, it was like 150 pictures of the same thing. Me going to reach for him, you know, and him to stand there jamming and he got the shot. And then, um, it showed up in every single rock magazine in America, Europe, everywhere. And my phone was blowing up. They're like, dude, you're in a magazine. <laughs> it was kind of cool, but, um, very yeah, cool. It made me feel kind of cool, you know? How ironic. That's a great one. Dude, you're in a magazine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Like, I wasn't ever in one of those before. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <laughs> but I like it was that. Deal, yeah. What do you got, Mark? Mine's a little different. Okay. And mine goes something like this. So the nails are traveling in, a, in my van, in our van. We're supporting the Jesus and Mary chain. So March first or second we're transitioning out of florida and heading up the east coast through the carolinas and back then i had a bag phone <laughs> so um i could be reached so my phone rings and it's my mother i go hey mom what's up she goes and i'm driving and she goes yeah um hi um I was just wondering, where are you? And I said, I'm in the van. We're driving a day drive up the East Coast. You know, we got a day off. And she goes, well, I need you to come home. Your father is sick. Hmm. I was like, okay, like the flu, mom? And she's like, no, no, he's going in for immediate open heart surgery. It's like, oh, Christ. Oh, wow. So I find the nearest airport. And um, the two puddle jump home and then a small commuter jet home well anyway i hand the money over to sean the um sound engineer and we had sean and then bob henning the lighting guy and myself and the band so i jump on a plane and i get home i i finally get home and my last flight was delayed i get into hopkins around nine o'clock and my dad's going into surgery the next day so i get i get 
I get on the, uh, I get in the taxi. I go to St. Vincent Charity Hospital. I arrive and they're saying the visiting hour is over. And like, I knew where my dad was and which room he was in. And I said, I'm sorry, I need to go see my dad. And they're like, you can't go see your dad. And I go, watch me. And I, sir, sir. And I get on the elevator and I go up to the seventh floor and I get off and I knew what room he was in. And you, do, you look down the hall and you're like, okay, that room's that way. So I went to his room and I get in there and everybody else was gone, my, including my mom. And I get in there and he's like, oh, you made it. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm telling, I told him the whole story how I got there. And he goes, I'm so glad you made it. And I'm so glad that you're here. And I said, yeah, me too, dad. I go, what's going on? He goes, oh, my heart's not doing so good. And, and I got to have open heart surgery tomorrow. And I'm kind of scared. And I go, well, I mean, is it, is it, is it temperamental? He goes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit risky, but you know, I'll, I'll probably be fine. So in your head, you're thinking you're, you're going to be fine. Yeah. So he said, I, I just wanted to say, um, I'm so proud of you and what you've done with your career. And I, I, I told you um, four years ago, you're insane to quit your job and that this trade school thing was going to be, you know, that you weren't going to make it. So not only did you get out of the school and support, start, start supporting yourself, move out of the house, you stuck to your guns, you had this vision and your siblings are showing me this band's video on, what is that thing called again? MTV, son? I go, yeah, MTV. He goes, yeah. So you got this, you know, you know, and then your sister brings me this article from a magazine and it's so exciting. And I'm so glad that you're, you're doing what you want to do. And um, I think that's really amazing. And I'm really proud of you. You know, your sister is a, uh, uh, Megan has got kicked out of her second college. Your brother, Michael's in a bad marriage, looking at divorce. Your sister, Tracy's working in New York and she hates it. And your brother George is in his freshman year of college. He's in the womb of the university. But here you are. You're doing your own thing. You, you've hung your shingle. You're successful. And it looks like you're going to be doing fine. And to me, that's when I felt like a rock star. That's, that's exactly when I felt like a rock star. I was like, fuck yeah, validation. And he died two days later. So. Oh, Mark. Yes, that that's an amazing story. Yep. I was on my here's the funny thing. I was on my way out the door. It's not funny, but it's weird. I was yeah. on my way out the door to go back out on the tour. Yeah. And um we were leaving from Trent. You may remember Joyce Najat. I was yeah. dating Joyce Najat. She's a good friend of Karen Warren at least. Yeah. So yeah. dating Joyce. So Joyce and I are gonna are like literally going to get in the taxi to go to Hopkins to go to the New York show that for Jesus and Mary Chain and Nine Inch Nails at the Ritz. Um, two shows sold out, early show, late show. Late show. So um, she goes, phone's ringing. I go, yeah. She goes, my phone never rings at this time of the morning. Yeah. So I get it, it's my mom. She says, you need to come down here. So um, but the funny thing was, something happened at the Ritz. Both shows canceled. Oh. <laughs> then, so my dad's like, my son's not there. No show. No show. <laughs> so like um, a couple days, a couple days ago, and ironically, there was like two days after the New York show. Those guys all came home and were sitting in the balcony tr at Trent at St. Malachy's for my father's mass. Oh wow! The guys in the band, John Mom and Sean Bevan, were all sitting together in the balcony at St. Malachy's. That's cool. Yeah, no, it's cool. Classy move. So at, at St. Vincent's that night, when my dad was just like, you know, giving me the whole, you know, I thought you were a fucking dumbass, going to fall flat on your face goofball, telling me you did well, you did right. And I was like. Yeah, hell yeah. What was your father's name? George Hahn. George Hahn, hell yeah, I like it. That's good to know he was proud of you, you know, because I mean, you, people can feel that, but it sure is nice to hear it. So it's a good, it's a nice thing to have. And part of that was kind of his fault, because when I was a kid, he would say to me, like, what do you want for Christmas? I'd say, can I get Crosby, Stills, Natch & Young so far? And he'd be like, okay. And then mm -hmm. he would say, what do you want for your first communion? i go, oh, I'd really like to get the Paul Revere narrator's greatest hits. He's like, yeah, sure. <laughs> so he would take me <laughs> to Gold Circle, Trent, and we would buy records at Gold Circle. And as, as conservative as he was, never censored your music my music taste it was just like whatever album you want to buy kid i don't care you know if that's your thing that's your thing you know 
So that's kind of fun. That's kind of his fault. Good for him. Well, you had a good career out of it. So he was, uh, I think his at fault was, a uh, was to the benefit of all. Yeah. What the hell? Yeah. Good. What did you guys think of the Drew Carey show with the Cleveland rocks? The whole practice. I worked, I worked with Drew Carey actually. Yeah. Um, I, mean, I was I the first know that. The show. Yeah. And, um, and I did a lot of stuff when they filmed in Cleveland, you know, um, we did the, you know, when they did the football episode at the stadium when it was new and stuff. And yeah, he's a great guy. He's still really cool. I've seen him. I now. loved his show. I love it. Have MC comedy nights. He worked at the improv when I was. Yeah, remember working. when, the, what was the Seven comedy club that was on West six or West ninth? Uh, comedy club, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I worked, I worked at at the it was on the side the street in warehouse district and then they put the comedy oh, yeah. club in the flats yeah but i used yeah. to see him as the local host comic at the one when it, that it was it, it was up in the warehouse district area mm-hmm. yeah he was a fucking i was a door guy there when he was performing it was pretty cool <laughs> i love this show it was so much fun to watch the song the theme song was great and I, uh, there was a guy who wrote, uh, was writer on, his name is Sam Simon. Sam uh, did really well because he was the co-creator of The Simpsons. So early on, Sam got into an argument with Matt Groening. And the decision was, is that uh, Sam felt he was doing all the work or whatever. So they got into a fight. Sam went his own way and he had nothing to do with the show. He just got paid and paid and paid and then paid more he was a very very wealthy man and he became a major animal rights activist and um he passed away young he had cancer and i I was at this auction i I buy and sell memorabilia and they had like 38 emmys roll by because there were sam's emmys from the simpsons and he wasn't doing the show anymore but he was one of the co co co-creators and i just watched the car and they looked at me they're like none of it's selling asshole and i'm kind of like oh (laughs) but i did get all of his stuff from the drew carey show so i got like his director's chair and some fun stuff it was a fun show you know there's a lot of good pictures of him and mimi that are just you can tell they're just having fun. It's behind the scenes, fucking around stuff. And it was oh, yeah. great, it man. Was really like that. Every, every time I worked with them, it was always, everybody was always laughing. The, the cast was always super cool to everyone. A lot of times when you're in that position, the cast is kind of like separate from the crew and you know what, not which is understandable, but they were, they were all over it. If they saw me standing there, like Mimi would walk up, Hey, what are you doing? It was, it was cool. They were cool. Like it's the mushroom head guy. <laughs> I, I get that still when I go home to visit and stuff, but. I guess that was kind of like one of my big things or something in Cleveland. I don't know, but I'm not really that guy. They're, hey, they're listen, big... people from Cleveland are fucking funny, dude. They are. Yeah. We are fucking funny. You know, I mean, <laughs> one, look at one of the well, look at one of the best comedic actresses out there. Although the, now she's doing some seri- some other kind of drama. Karen Hahn or Catherine Hahn. Oh yeah. Funny as hell, man. I didn't know she was from Cleveland. Yeah. My There's cousin. so many people from Cleveland. So many. She's my cousin. Oh, you're kidding. Catherine Hahn is my cousin. Ah. Oh. So he was waiting for you to be like, she's great. <laughs> <laughs> what was yeah. your favorite item in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame when you worked there? What was the piece that stood Oh, that's out? a good one. Wow, you know, um, what the cool thing is, I could say all kinds of stuff, but the coolest thing was that um, I was there when they were putting a lot of the stuff in. And so um, I got to sit in Janis Joplin's Porsche. Oh, I was going to say 356 Porsche all painted up. So cool. Yeah, we weren't supposed to do any of this, but we, I have pictures of it. But I also put on Michael Jackson's hat. Which oh, was yeah. A <laughs> we did so many things. We, I, I'll, be, I'll be real blunt with you. I'll be totally honest. We used to smoke weed in the, hall, in the stairwells and get away with it forever. And we, I mean, we just, rock and roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, I don't think anyone. <laughs> funny, this guy Dana had a sailboat on the near west side of Cleveland, and one night we all went out drinking, and we were um, on his sailboat. We decided to sail by the Rock Hall, and I'm like, "Well, we can't get in trouble. I work there." So we went into the channel inside the break wall where you're really not supposed to be, and they have lights that light up the Rock Hall that are in the water, and they're like yes. on and they light up the Rock Hall, you know. And the wind picked up, and we kind of ran into one of them <laughs> and knocked the light out and it was a big deal the coast guard came the whole deal right <laughs> so anyway i had to work the next morning and uh and i go in and i might find all these people are talking i'm like what's going on they're like somebody had a boat and they ran into the rock hall last night and i'm like 
what do you mean? They didn't, first of all, they didn't run into the rock hall. They ran into the light outside. They're like, how do you know? I'm like, I was in the boat. <laughs> Thank God they thought it was funny. Because, <laughs> you know, I mean, I worked there. That's the name of your, uh, that's the name of your autobiography. I was in the boat. In, uh, so we did Lollapalooza, as you, as you all know. And we dropped off Lollapalooza early which caused a little bit of a problem for them because we had gained so much steam as an integral part of the tour and we dropped, we didn't do the last three dates. It might've been four, but I know it was at least three and they were getting ticket returns. So they were trying to convince us you need to do it. And mom is John mom's like, uh, no, Chris Blackwell, one of the most powerful men in the music business is expecting us to start our, European tour. We're not going to delay a European tour. Sorry. So they're like, ah, anyway. So we go over to Europe and we opened for Guns N' Roses in Mannheim. Nine Inch Nails, Skid Row, Guns N' Roses. Nice. Then tour goes on seven, eight, nine, ten 10 shows. We ended up back at Wembley fucking stadium opening for Guns N' Roses, Nine Inch Nails, Skid Row, Guns N' Roses. Sick. But there was two two bad stories in there I really can't tell just yet. Yeah, Trent's young ears here. He no, one, one, one funny, funny, funny story at Mannheim and then the follow-up story at... Um, at Wembley, let's just say that um, due to Jeff Ward, who was our drummer at the time, who came to us from Ministry and the Revolting Cox and Lard. Rest in um, peace. Rest in peace, Jeffrey. Great guy. Je <laughs> and he was a big dude. I mean, he was he was as big as Andy from Every Time I Die, like that big and that strong. And Jeff, Jeff was just a ball buster from South Chicago who lived with his aunt and his aunt was Al Capone's cousin. Oh shit. Anyway, <laughs> Jeff's desire to play a practical joke on Skid Row went way too far. <laughs> <laughs> way too far. When we showed up, cause John Reese was doing security for oh, um, Skid Row back then. And John Reese wanted to fucking kill us at Wembley. He was ready to strangle us. <laughs> you know, it's and, funny. I, I just thought of something. Speaking of Nine Inch Nails, um, this is really a good one. I, now, what I'm going to talk about is posted on my Instagram if you want to see it. And I actually still have it. But are you guys played Nautica Stage in Cleveland? I think. Courtney Love, Marilyn Manson. Yes. Whole. I should say whole Marilyn Manson Nine Inch Nails. And at the time, Courtney and Trent were having a little pro some problems between each other, I think. Oh, no. No, no. Or no, this is what caused the problem. Never no, mind. No, I, I, I There ain't nobody who knows that story better than me. Wait, I know. But wait, wait, you tell your story. <laughs> so at the time, um, I was bartending and running a club on the other side of the, the river, the boiler room, Nine Oh Bar. Yes. And... Um, after that show, we had a big party, and I remember yes. Courtney stayed for two days, and I hung out with her and Melissa and my friend and a couple other, Shelly and a couple people, and um, she wanted to write a letter to get to Trent Reznor and wondered if anybody could get it to him, and I knew that I could probably give it to, you know, John or, like, somebody or whatever, but I didn't, I didn't really want to be involved, you know, or whatever. So I'm not going to say what it said, but she wrote a letter to Trent Reznor and signed it, Courtney Love Cobain and everything. And if you want to see it, go on my Instagram and see it. But like, it caused a lot of rift between them. And she wanted me to rip that up and never show anyone again. But at that point, I had already cop you know, copied it and given it to John Malm and like all kinds of stuff. Oh my God, she's... She comes back on Lollapalooza. She comes back on Lollapalooza 
and she's like calls my friend Sherry that was with me that night because they kept in touch and she's like hey why don't you and Chad come to the show and blah 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 and she was like oh I'm surprised she remembered you I'm like me too you know but whatever that's cool so we went to the show at, at Blossom and like she was she was really cool um let me just end it by saying that I ended up with her panties and stockings and a few other things I probably shouldn't have but <laughs> it, was a trip. it was a trip I still have them too good <laughs> I got some better ones, but I can't, again, I can't tell them here, but I got to kind of, yeah. I remember I tormented the Smashing Pumpkins. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. With yeah. Pearl we, Jam, right? And Chili Peppers. Right. We, we went out, we went out, it was um, Pearl Jam, Pumpkins in the Middle, and Peppers Closed. And um, so I got to be really good friends with obviously the pumpkins and the guys from Pearl Jam and the Peppers. So, um, <laughs> Billy, always a man of uh, international mystery and intrigue, <laughs> decides that, again, the that tour, we dropped off, I think, in Denver. And that tour went on to do like three or four more shows, again, maybe four. And it was really weird. I'm like, here I am again on another tour and we're not finishing it for some reason. Well, why the reason why we didn't finish it is because Billy wanted to go out to the West Coast and do pumpkin shows. Like, and, and, and to, still to this day, I never understood it. Why? To me, it didn't make any sense because I believe that that Pearl Jam, Peppers, Pumpkin Store would have ended in Vancouver and then we could have just headed south. Didn't, I, I don't know. I didn't get it. There, there, I'm sure there was a good reason. So Andy Gershon is their manager. Andy calls me and says, you're going to go out on the road with uh, the pumpkins. And we're going to drop off the tour early. And um, you guys are going to start off. I think it was in San Diego or something like that. So Andy's having these conversations with Billy about who's going to open the tour. And he goes, whole. And Andy Gershon goes, no. And Billy goes, yes. And Andy goes, no. And so they were going on back and forth. So eventually, Hole opens the tour for us. So I put this tour itinerary together. Um, I type up a copy for me to have, a copy for Jackie Farr, who is the road manager for Hole. I love that gal, too. And so I give her a copy, and she goes, do you happen to have another copy? I go, I really don't. I go, who needs a third copy? And she goes, um, well, Kurt and Courtney are going to travel in their own car. I'm like, oh, cool. OK, sure. So got a copy, gave it to him. He, he drove, like they drove a, a silver Lincoln town car. Holes driving in their van. We're driving in our van. We're playing clubs up and down the West Coast. And he got her there every day. He was on time for sound check. And it was like really kind of cool. It was kind of like. It's fucking Kirk Cobain. He's kind of roadieing. <laughs> kind He's of, on his shit too. <laughs> He's kind of roadieing and driving his wife around. It was just, it was kind of surreal. So I got to know him and meet him, and he was he was really cool. But um, that was my introduction to Courtney, and uh, it was really interesting. And um, so we end up flying to Japan, the Pumpkins, after the first of the year. Um, no. We went from, we took a Christmas break, then we went to Europe. And after Europe, we went to Japan. Well, in Japan, we played like five shows. And um, one night we had off, we were able to go see Nirvana play a small theater. So I remember walking in on our day off, Nirvana's playing. I'm over on stage right, I'm sitting on a road case. Billy's sitting on my left jimmy's sitting on my right and we're, we're far off stage right and um the show starts band walks up on stage and they start doing their thing and then up stage right out of a rear uh, off the rear wall door uh, out comes courtney with a heineken and a marlboro <laughs> pregnant at the time with francis of she comes over she goes, marco she comes over and she's like gives me this big hug she gives Jimmy a hug. 
And Billy's sitting there and his coat goes, do I get a hug? And she goes, if that guy sees me hug you, you're going to be wearing that Jaguar. <laughs> Walked away. Or something like that. <laughs> Billy would refute that, but, you know. But um, some reason, Billy doesn't like me. I saw him about five years ago and he completely ignored me. Um, I didn't kill him. I didn't hurt him. So, He's tall. Um, Maybe he didn't see you. No, he saw me. For yeah. Because sure. Jimmy, Jimmy saw me, came right up to me and gave me a hug and said, come see me in five minutes when we sat down and talked for 45 minutes. You know, he including owns face, now the... Including <clears throat> FaceTiming with his dog. So. He owns now the N, NWA, I think this wrestling thing. I have these two wrestlers yeah, on here. It's... He doesn't need to be playing drums. He told me the whole story. He goes, I don't need to be playing music anymore. Oh, I and know. when he did that, when the Pumpkins did that tour called Pumpkins and Plain Song, and Jimmy, Jimmy was the unannounced special guest, he told Billy, I'll do it, but you can't use me in the billing. Oh. So whenever, the only time anybody ever knew was that Jimmy was there is either through the internet postings or when he was brought on stage. And that was like the fourth of his song in the set. So anyway, so Courtney, uh, we find out that Hole's going to do those shows with us that Trent's referring about. And yeah. Trent, the first show of that tour was Nautica. Yeah. The first, the first tour, the first day that they did shows with us was Nautica. And, and I saw like, Trent's going like, so what's she like, man? And I go, very sharp. I said, Trent, you remember Jim Rose? He goes, how can I forget Jim Rose? I go, she's a lot like Jim Rose. She's a carny supreme. I said, she'd talk your mother out of her bra on an airplane. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? She's that crafty. So he, he uh, <laughs> good memories of you though, Courtney. So um, she gets, she, she was getting death threats. And you remember the cop? I do remember that. Yeah, yeah cop yeah. had to go pick her up at the airport. That was back in the day where you could meet somebody at the gate. So an off-duty police officer that used to work for Belkin Productions meets her at her gate, brings her from her gate to the gig. He walks into that backside door over near catering, Trent, mm -hmm. and she comes in through the gate, and I go, oh, boy, here we go. And she's, like, <laughs> liquored up already, and she's running late. And she walks into past the catering tent. She walks into the center area where all the dressing room chairs were. Mm -hmm. And I'm walking out and, and she looks, she goes, Mark O'Shea, what the fuck are you doing here? <laughs> I'm tour managing 90 snails. And Trent and Robin are sitting on the steps outside their dressing room trailer. And I look over at Trent and I go, told you I knew her. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so then she goes over, she goes, Oh, where's my band? She goes over to the dressing room. She goes, okay. She comes, then she comes running back over to me. She goes, it's immediate. I need to use a phone right away. And I go, no problem, Courtney. So I bring her in the office and she walks in. She sits down at my phone and she says, she gets on the phone with the merch person. Meanwhile, she's got a baby doll tea in her hand, right? One of her shirts that's on sale. This is not the thread count I asked for. And these colors are off and the printing on this sucks. If you can't get it right, I'm sending all of these back and get it right. And I want them in two days. <laughs> Hung up the phone. Okay, where's my dressing room again? I mean, <laughs> sharp. Yeah. Sharp. I mean, it, even though she was, so she had a mind for business. So um, let's just say that the night went downhill from that point forward. <laughs> Yeah. Starting when she put her foot up on the floor wedge, and and it scared the hell out of Party Marty. Oh my <laughs> god! Poor Party Marty was in the pit, you know, and he's doing securities in the barricade. Whoa! <laughs> ain't nothing but monkey, you know. He's looking up there. Ain't nothing but monkey. She was wearing that baby doll dress with nothing on underneath. Yeah, she did that a lot. Yeah. So it just all went downhill from that point forward. And, um, you know, there was a lot of bonding that went on at some of the after show parties, like, you know, when um, Drew Barrymore showed up because she was dating Eric at the time. Um, Melissa Oftemar was fucking awesome to hang out with. You're totally right on that. Really cool, yeah. She was like, and then Patty, you know, 
Watch your wallet around Patty, man, because she needed a dollar to go play pool. She was going to steal your wallet, man. She's a <laughs> funny lady. I like that gal. Great drummer. Yeah. So that whole cast of characters. But there was a lot of bonding going on, a lot of great things. And, you know, he never really said anything bad about her. But then there was this, you know, the, to the Downward Spiral Tour continued. And right towards the end, towards the end of the campaign for that tour, we ended up staying at... Um, Sunset Marquee in Los Angeles on La Cienega. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, and and Trent had a uh, a villa. And uh, we were out after a show or out on a night off and um, got back to the hotel and Jerry Meltzer. You remember Jerry Meltzer, our bodyguard, our security mm -hmm. guy? Yeah. Jerry calls me, he goes, hey, Sparkles. Joel, that was my nickname. So everybody got a nickname. I, I told you everybody got a nickname. Right. It, on my, it still says it on my road case, Sparkles. So why so, Sparkles? Since we went through we went through Robin's Queenie, right? right. Queenie, with right. So um, Jerry calls him and goes, "Hey, Sparkles. Um, <laughs> that sparkles. You, you got to get up. You got to get up, and you got to meet me in the backyard behind Trent's villa." And I'm like, "What's up? Just meet me in the backyard." Okay. So I meet him in the backyard and he goes, he looks at me and he goes, she's here. I go, what? He goes, Courtney, she's here. I go, yeah, what's the problem? He goes, T didn't let her in. She found out where we were staying, talked her way in through the front desk into his villa. And he gets back home and she's in the villa. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> crazy episode i don't know if trent's ever i don't know if he'll hate me for this or i don't know if he'll take away my tickets to the september shows <laughs> but, um, it's kind of a while sorry, ago. Sorry, trent. <laughs> sorry trent but uh, the story stops there she ended up in his villa kind of freaked him out and that's i think that's when she crossed the boundary of friendship yeah yeah she's kind of like you know, snuck into his villa. He just wants to go home and relax. And she just wants to, hey, let's hang out. Let's talk and party. And he's just like, whoa. Why me? So he says, so during that tour, he had a lot of abuse issues. He's been really public about it. Was he a pain in the ass to deal with when he was all no. jacked up? No. Always easy. No. And I, I would like to humbly say something and he may or may not agree with me. And, and if he eventually gets a hold of this, it really doesn't matter because we're all in recovery. At the time, I'd like to say that in a way, because of the fact we all grew up together, so to speak, I don't think he ever wanted to look or act like an idiot in, yeah. front, of, in front of his friends. So there were nights where we all got really liquored up and there were some nights where some of the other extracurricular stuff came out, but I hadn't touched that stuff in eight years up to that point. And I'd look at him and he'd look at me and I'd look at him and I go, he go, what? I go, what are you, Don Johnson? And he's Crockett. It's just, you know, it's just Crockett and Cubs here. You know, I said to him, Trent, I go, Joel, you won't get this. I said, I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that kind of blow since the, men's room at uh, tracks you know it's like <laughs> or euphoria you know i mean come on you, you guys know, use some you used to have some stellar after show parties i have to say oh yeah but I, again it, it was usually just tequila or beer Lots yeah. of, i remember a lot of tequila you know and I, I i never saw like pills or a coke problem right you know once in a while the coke would come out but I'd like to think that um, there was kind of like, you know, a little bit of that, like, I can't do coke around Marco because he, he'll think I'm an yeah. asshole, you know, right, right. or or not. I, I, I never saw it as a problem. You know, I, I never, never saw that side. Honestly, didn't. Yeah, yeah I, I just found my dog tag from the party you guys had on New Year's Eve in Detroit when you had the industry party afterwards. Do you remember that? I I was so my wife can't hear this. I was so drunk I was pulling my pants down. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I was there with Tommy Mancini. Tommy, and a bunch of us. Yeah, Tommy and, Mancini, Tommy Veets, and Sarah Kilcoin. Yes, oh yes. And, and uh and wait, Chris. 
Chris, uh, Tommy's Chris. Tommy's Chris. Christine. Oh, Christine. Yeah, she was there too. Connolly, Christine Connolly. Yeah. yeah, and Sandy too. Yeah. Um, you got a great head for names, Mark. Christine Connolly. <laughs> you remember the last names and everything of people. It's remarkable. I that was their job. It was their job. Why do they call it you Sparkles? Was to, it was easier to remember a name than to try and write it down. Well, that's why we have nicknames. This is fucking, it's a little easier. What was Trent's <laughs> nickname? Yeah. Did um, Trent have a nickname? Uh, Trenty. Oh, that's creative. It was, no, it wasn't. We really, <laughs> we really didn't come up with one. Yeah. As everybody knows, Chris Brenner was Pod Boy. Okay. Um, uh, Jeff, Jeff Ward, when he was around, his nickname was Abner. Um, little Abner? Yeah, because he wasn't so little. Right. Um, uh, Danny Loner, he had a stupid one. It was Boner. Um, Robbins was Queenie. Um, Charlie, when Charlie was around, we just called him Clouser. Hey, Clouser. We just called him by his last name. Um, James Woolley was Woolly Bear. Oh, Wooly Bear, and then um, Lee Mars when he was playing keyboards with the band, he was Lemur, and that's pretty much it. That's yeah, that's pretty much everybody from my oh, and then Richard Patrick's nickname was was of all nicknames was Piggy. 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 Yeah. Is that from uh, Lord of the Rings stuff? No, I, it might have been, but Richard Patrick when he used to drink, he would sit there and he have this. Uh, Richard actually is 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 actually very very funny okay like comedic funny um and he would sit there and he would go into this character who was piggy including with a voice and a way he would walk <laughs> it was just he would just and you know like richard like trent once in a while would go hey richard do piggy you know so he would turn into piggy you know laugh. and that's where that came from and i don't think that had any i don't think the song hey piggy had anything to do with Richard, as some people would think it is. I think Trump was just always fascinated with pigs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, is all, a, uh, all lined he's a, up. He's a vegetarian or he's a public vegan or something, isn't he? No, I don't know. Not back then he wasn't. I don't know, maybe I'm making shit up now. I don't know. A lot of nights at Morton's, a lot of nights at Ruth's Chris. Oh yeah, those Good are great stuff. Ones. Anyway, I'll let you guys go, but I genuinely appreciate the time. And uh, it, it was so good to talk to you guys both. Have a kick-ass weekend. Enjoy your Memorial you Day. Too. Yeah, you too. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, guys. All right. Well, I'll talk to you rock, soon. Rock and roll. Rock and roll. Hey, thanks for watching Party Like a Rockstar. If you're not already subscribed to the Facebook or YouTube channels, do it. We're also on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. The handle is Party of Stars. Thanks for watching. You'll see you next time.